Thank you, Vidya, and good evening, everybody. Um, I never had the opportunity to meet Ila Almia, sadly. I can only hope that this lecture will be worthy of her memory. Um, and I want to thank Yashodra and everybody at FICA um, for inviting me for this lecture. It's really a great joy for me to be here. Uh, this audience has um, quite a few friendly, familiar faces, including the faces of students whom I taught at JNU two and a half years ago, um, and also some people I don't know. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly explain how this lecture is going to unfold, okay? So um, this is a talk about wickedness. Um, that's a topic I have a particular interest in, um, maybe because I've seen rather a lot of it in my life, also in myself sometimes, um, but particularly in the um, Israeli-occupied West Bank, where, uh, as we just said, uh, I've been active as an activist in this organization called Ta'ayush. So I have rather a lot of thoughts about wickedness, and I'll be sharing some of them with you tonight. You'll notice that I prefer to talk about wickedness and not evil, and I'll tell you why. Um, in English, my English, um, evil has a kind of abstract and disembodied ring to it. Um, people talk about the problem of evil. It's a philosophical topic. It's treated as a metaphysical thing um, or some kind of force that is maybe automatic, like, say, gravity or something like that. There is evil in the world somehow, and philosophers like to try to figure out why. Whereas wickedness to me um, has an altogether different sound. If you think of a wicked person, it seems kind of personal, as if it were a human thing. And actually, I think that wickedness is a human thing, above all. That's what interests me in it. And so I'm going to be talking about wickedness. Um, as uh, Vidya and I were corresponding about what topic I should choose for tonight, uh, it became clear after a while that it would be nice to have some South Asian Indian piece of this lecture, and then something from the Palestinian um, activist side. Okay, so there will be two parts to the lecture. Um, I'm going to begin with this South Asian Telugu text, South Indian text, the um, Pandoranga Mahatmyamu by Tenali Ramakrishnudu. Uh, I'm going to tell you one story. Actually, I'll read you some verses that I've translated together with Vilcheru Narayanarao from the text. Uh, and when that is finished, um, maybe in around 20 minutes or so from now, then we'll make a transition. I mean, I'll have a few thoughts to share with you about the story. Then um, we'll make a transition into talking about um, Palestine and activism and wickedness and so on. Um, and at that point, you'll know this is the case. I mean, I'll give you an indication, but among other things, I'm going to um, click on what I hope will be the right button here on this laptop, and there'll be visual material. Uh, this is an audience in which there are a lot of people working in visual arts. So I wanted you to have some sense of what these landscapes and people look like in the area that we work. Actually, I think the pictures are far more important than anything I will say. I'm going to have them just running in the background on this screen for the second half of the lecture, okay? So, okay, we're going to begin. I want to tell you just a word or two about this text. Um, this is a 16th century Telugu text from the classic period, the great golden age of Telugu literature. Um, it was um, composed sometime in the middle of the 16th century, probably uh, in what is called Rayalaseema, the southern part of Andhra. There is a certain meaning to that. I'm not going to go into it. It's called the Pandoranga Mahatmimu, and it's a kind of uh, Telugu version of the Stala Purana, that is to say the local tradition at the great shrine of Pandarpur in Maharashtra, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, I've become, through this text, very interested in Pandarpur, uh, Yigal Broner, my colleague, was here, and I are taking our students to Pandarpur in February. Um, and uh, I, we were there actually a year ago. It's a marvelous place. So here's one of the stories 
the Tenali Ramakrishna do tells us about uh, Pandarpur and the god Vitoba Vitala. So the hero of this story, or actually he's the villain of this story, he's a young, handsome Brahmin from Kalinga, that is Orissa, and his name is Nigama Sharma. And uh, this Nigama Sharma manages to commit nearly all the most terrible crimes the Indian tradition has defined, but he's particularly given to indiscriminate, polluting, and ultimately cruel debauchery, among other things. Um, this story, by the way, belongs in a whole series of rather popular stories um, around something like this, some hardened sinner and what happens to him. Now, I'm going to be reading you some verses from our translation. I'm going to give you a kind of kudiyatam-like sign when I go into the text. I'm going to do something like that, okay? That means that you're hearing actually the text in our English translation, you know. And the rest of the time you'll be hearing my comments. So Nigama Sharma, he didn't blow on the Vedic fire in his house to fan it, but he would sigh hot sighs when he was longing for a woman. He never folded his hands in worship at dawn, but he would bow down to women whose eyes were red with jealousy. He never entered into arguments on Vedic matters, but he could easily settle disputes between men fighting over a woman at dawn. He never drank water poured over Vishnu's feet, but he was addicted to the intoxicating taste of young women's lips. He was embarrassed to mark his body with the signs of Vishnu, but he was proud of the fresh nail marks scratched on his skin while making love. He was a playboy, delighting in everything bad. He was a Brahmin only in name, like the butter squash that has no butter. That's the Neti Birakaya, some of you will know. His Brahminical thread was only for show. He was light years away from the Veda. The more his parents punished him, the more stubborn he became. Over time, he gave up even a pretense of decency. Now this is me. Nigama Sharma was married to a good woman to whom he paid not the slightest attention. He preferred common whores, and he was quite prepared to steal in order to feed his habit, even stripping his mother of her gold ornaments. At his friend's house, he would drink heavy liquor. He never went home. He got money only by gambling, stealing, and lying, and he spent it on stupid, useless things. All the good name of his family was gone. He hit the bottom. Eventually, he's reduced to destitution, and he's tempor temporarily redeemed by the determined attention of a loving sister who waits for him at his home until he turns up looking for leftover food. She approached him and was about to embrace him until she saw the fresh nail marks, half circles still red with blood, left on his body by passionate young women. They looked like disconnected syllables in a composition by a bad poet. <laughs> and overcoming her distress, this sister bathes him, feeds and cares for him, and tries her best to awaken in him some affection for his wife. She also lectures him on his responsibilities and begs him to adopt a good life. And for a few days, this seems to work. Nigama Sharma opens the Sanskrit books he hadn't touched for years. He speaks politely to his wife. He even washes his father's laundry with his own hands. But then one night, incorrigible, he steals all the jewels and gold and family heirlooms belonging to his wife, his sister, and his mother, and heads into the forest. But things don't go so well for him there. A band of robbers attack him, take everything he has, shoot arrows into his body, and leave him for dead. Luckily, however, a simple peasant farmer happens by and finds him. The farmer takes him home and brings doctors to heal his wounds. So, like a lamp kept in a windless space with plenty of oil and ghee, protected from all man-made and fate-made dangers, he survived, lovingly cared for by his friends. In his deceitful nature, he would strike up a conversation and tell them of the great family he came from, and they believed him. They, the farmer and his wife and family, treated him as a god, as a teacher, and as a trusted friend. He lived with them like the tongue in a mouth, like a thread strung with flowers, like water mixed with milk. He was not separate from them. Their minds met as one. 
But guess what? There was a beautiful daughter-in-law in that family, and very soon she and Nigama Sharma were enjoying forbidden pleasures, which our hero rationalized with a Sanskrit saying. That's one reason you need Sanskrit. He remembered something he'd read. Narake satikim dosho marane satikim payam. Why worry about sins if you're anyway going to hell? Why be afraid when you're anyway going to die? So he carried on, desperate and oblivious, even though it might kill him. Finally, during a wild festival for the village goddess, Ganga of the Wind, the two lovers elope. As, by the way, the Kama Sutra recommends, you know, they, the Kama Sutra says that's a good vacation to elope when there's a village festival. And after wandering for some time in the forest, they join a village of hunters and adopt their ways. He was born a Brahmin, something you can't achieve even after hundreds of lives, and he gave it up in a minute. He drank liquor, hunted, and ate meat. She, the runaway wife, hunted with him in the forest, and the bees hovered around her face to savor, savor the fragrance of her breath. And one day she dies. Nigama Sharma takes up with a mala, a Dalit woman, the most impure of the impure. He has children with her. He lives by killing wild animals. But coming home from a long day hunting, he finds that his hut has burned down and his mala, concubine, and their children are dead. So now listen carefully. He cried like water poured from a pot. He passed out when he came to Wicked as he was, through the strength of his mind, he sat down on the ground, helpless. He was shaking his head. He was foaming at the mouth. He was remembering his wife, speaking of her with affection. Usually men buy women with money, but dear wife, I got you in exchange for my high birth. I thought your black body would last forever. I didn't know it was like a flash of lightning until now. I can still hear your sweet voice filling my ears as you rested your vena on your breasts, your sari slipping down a little, and with perfect fingering and precise tone, you improvised in the raga as your fingernails plucked the strings. I couldn't care less when people looked at me with disgust. This Brahman, this god on earth, has fallen for a low-born woman. Or when they spat at me, I saw in your face an unblemished moon, and I found there the source of life. He was thinking, I want to see my children and her again. Until I do, I can't eat or drink. So fasting, he went on walking deep into the forest where nobody goes. His head was bent low, <clears throat> without food or drink, like a person in pain who was going to be accepted by God. He was staggering as if going nowhere in that dark forest. He fell like a person giving up his miserable body. He rose like someone who was leaving this low world and who saw the path to Vishnu of infinite kindness. And indeed he does reach the god, of course at Pandarpur. That's the side he stumbles on and there he dies having taken the god into himself. And when Yama, the god of death, sends his soldiers to take Nigamasharma to hell, Vishnu himself intervenes and brings him to heaven. He gets a new name, Kumuda. You can still see him today in Pandarpur, standing in stone among those who are closest to the god. That's the story. And we could easily write it off as just one more tale of the magical potency of some shrine that translates the pilgrim to heaven after dying. And there are many such stories. But interestingly, the Telugu poet, Tenali Ramakrishna, doesn't go that way. You heard the verses describing Nigama Sharma's grief. <clears throat> Amazingly, it turns out that he was capable of loving, capable, in fact, of choosing that love for the impure Mala woman over the conventional social values of purity and hierarchy and all the rest. He mourns her with a wounded heart. The real miracle is not that Nigama Sharma goes to heaven after reaching Pandarpur, that's an almost trivial event, but that this hard-hearted, ruthless egoist has become human. In fact, it is just that theme, the notion of how a person, any person, can become a whole human being worthy of the name that interests the poet 
and should interest us as well. So for the rest of this lecture, we will be attempting to define and understand non-automatic, non-magical effects in the lives of imperfect human beings. You should notice that in that story, by Nigam, by, um, in the story, Nigama Sharma seems at times to waver. Again and again, after being saved from himself, nurtured back to health, lovingly cared for, he slips back into his wicked ways. But there is always that subtle moment of hesitation, a moment that might last no more than a few minutes or hours or days, and always ends with a choice, the wrong choice, until it is in the end too late or almost too late, since grieving and terribly alone, he does at last humanize himself. Now, I'm going to say just a few more things about this story, and then we'll switch into this other mode, okay? So an apparently wicked person becomes fully human. How does it happen? There are several things about Nigama Sharma that we need to notice, since they apply not only to him, but probably to all of us. First, his maturation into a full human being has nothing to do with thinking. I think this is rather important. It's not as if he had thought things through at some point and in doing so turned away from his previous wickedness. It's not like that at all. It's not a matter of rational decision. It happens to him because of terrible loss. And under those conditions, he comes to know that he was and maybe still is capable of loving. In fact, his ability to love seems to exist a priori, though a point comes when this is, for him, a surprising discovery. But loss is not the only pain he feels. Another, possibly even worse kind of agony awaits him. One way to describe it is to say that this hardened sinner begins to feel something akin to remorse. Remorse is a great human achievement. I'll come back to that. Remember the verse at the end, he fell like a person giving up his miserable body. He rose like someone who was leaving this low world and who saw the path to reach Vishnu of infinite kindness. So listen to what is going on in his mind. Suddenly he knows that there is such a thing as infinite kindness, something he needs since he has never found it in himself. And I think there's something more, something working in, inside his mind and his heart a kind of overwhelming regret or maybe indeed remorse. And we might also say that at this moment in his life, a kind of moral conscience is born. Not moral consciousness, but conscience. And it leads him to freedom. So these days, they're dark days for many human beings in many places on our planet. I am thinking a lot about conscience. I've asked myself if pre-modern India has a notion of conscience. And I think it does. I owe to my friend, our colleague Gary Tubb, the translation of Sanskrit Atmatushti, one of the four sources of dharma, as conscience. And modern Indian languages definitely have neologisms for this term, manasachi in Tamil, for example. And you can think about what word fits best in the languages that you know. But in the meantime, I'm going to try to explore further this notion of wickedness and in the light of this discovery of conscience. And I'm going to be speaking from my own experience um, in Ta'ayush in the South Hebron Hills on the occupied West Bank. I'll come back to the idea of conscience and how it is generated at the end of this talk. Okay. Is this right? Yes. Okay. These slides um, are going to go in a continuous row. Oh, no. They're going too fast. No, now it's okay. Okay. It should be about 20 seconds per slide. And they're just going to roll, roll on behind me as I speak, okay? So I recommend you look at the, fly, the slides and don't pay too much attention to what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, okay? So the first thing I have to say is I'm going to be talking about ordinary people who commit 
wicked crimes. I wanted you to be able to see these landscapes and the people and the animals who inhabit them. I think it's the most beautiful part of that land, you know. So again, I'm going to be speaking about ordinary people who do wicked things, not about malicious bu bullies or sadistic monsters or killers. There is never any dearth of those, but they matter less in the long run than the ordinary people like us, like me and like you. And I'm going to give you just a few quick examples so you'll see what I mean. I'm going to start with an incident which is a very fresh one. It happened exactly a week ago, last Saturday, um, in the South Hebron Hills um, at a place called Mitzpeh Yair. That's an Israeli settlement. It's um, inhabited by fanatical people with a messianic ideology. They can be very violent. They were last Saturday. Even in the rather loose definition of what constitutes legality inside Israel, in Israeli law, even under that definition, this place, meets Yair, is an illegal settlement. And those people should not be living there. In practice, however, there are hundreds of places like that, and the Israeli army protects them, and the government, all the recent Israeli governments have done whatever they could to keep these people there, to plant them there, and to keep them in place and to defend them, uh, even though they are without exception sitting on Palestinian land, um, including privately owned Palestinian land. So last Saturday, um, the Ta'ayush activists were down there um, accompanying shepherds and farmers, which is what we often do, because if we don't go with them, there's a very high probability that they'll be chased off the land at gunpoint by settlers who might also beat them or shoot at them or something like that. Um, when that was over, um, they went, the activists went to this place, Mitzpeh Yair, because the news had come in that there was new building going on there, a rather solid looking building. So remember the whole settlement is illegal. It's very important to document new extension of the building and to do whatever one can with that documentation. We usually will take it to the courts if we can, and sometimes that helps. So they were there to photograph this new building, and the, um, suddenly these settlers from the, um, from the some Israeli settlers, Jewish settlers, came pouring down the hill. Looks like, looks like some of the hills you'll, you'll be seeing here. And uh, they were extraordinarily violent, and they started beating the activists and stoning them with big heavy rocks and uh, throwing them down the mountain, down the hill, and um, really savage acts. Um, but I'm not going to say any more about them, about those settlers, because as I said, I don't find them that interesting, actually. I have something to say about them, but that's not for tonight. But I do want to talk a little bit about the soldiers who were there. There were soldiers there when these settlers attacked, you know. Um, I don't know exactly how many. Um, anyway, there was a small detachment of soldiers. And surprisingly, um, unlike what very often happens um, to us um, in those situations, uh, the usual thing is that these soldiers will side with the Israeli settlers or even join them in actually attacking us and beating us and arresting us and those kinds of things. You know, usually that's the normal thing. But um, last Saturday wasn't like that. These soldiers were actually rather sympathetic to the activists, but um, they were unable to stop the attack, which went on for about half an hour. So a very long time when people are beating you up. Um, I said they were unable to stop it. Um, that's, you know, it's, there's a question here. I can't go too deeply into it. They were armed, of course, with submachine guns. And I don't know for sure, but I would assume that they had other weapons, perhaps tear gas, and they could have shot in the air. They could have detained the violent settlers. Soldiers have the right to do that until the police turn up when they can be arrested, you know. 
Um, but they didn't do any of those things. At best, they tried to kind of slightly stand between some of the more violent settlers and the activists. That's about all. Um, so, I mean, you can read that in different ways. They'd lost control. There were quite a lot of settlers. Um, but there's also the fact that they're in the Israeli army and they're kind of, you might say, indoctrinated or brainwashed. You know, for example, let me, let me give you an example. Um, one of the activists, she's a woman, Michal Peleg, a friend of, friend of ours. Uh, she's a writer. Anyway, she was, she was beaten rather badly. She managed to somehow extricate herself for a moment and find refuge beside a female soldier. You know, the Israeli army has a lot of women soldiers. So this soldier, you know, was trying to kind of protect her. And she said, the soldier asked Michal, the activist, she said, why do you people come here? You have to listen to that question. Why do you people come here? And Michal answered without thinking, that's what she says. She said, Michal said, because we seek justice, which is a very good answer. But what about the soldier's question? See, I want to say that that point, exactly at this point where the soldier said, why do you people come down here? You know, that's where the wickedness begins for the soldiers. For the settlers, it's been there for a long time, but for the soldiers. Because what does that question imply? It means, um, you know, that um, the idea is behind it something which the soldier must have heard from her, you know, commanding officers or her comrades, I don't know. It implies that the human rights activists or peace activists like, like us, we come down seeking trouble to make trouble as a provocation. If we didn't turn up, things would be just fine, you know. Wouldn't need to have soldiers at Mitzpeyayu. So actually, the activists turn out to be responsible for the disaster that overcame them. I didn't tell you, actually, several people, five people were wounded. Four of them had to be uh, treated in hospital. One apparently broke his pelvic bone. I, I, don't go in, I won't go into all the details. They were badly hurt, some of them. And that was another thing, which was that uh, when the ambulances started to arrive, because uh, you know, they called the, the, police, the army called the ambulance, I think. So then the local security officer of the settlement, who was the settlement himself, wouldn't let the ambul ambulances um, evacuate these people from the road. There's a road there, of course. Settlements always have roads. Um, instead, they kept pushing them further down the hill into this kind of desert, you know, and they, it was really hard for the ambulances to negotiate at that time. It took a lot of time and people were in pain. Um, see, I think that these soldiers, even though they were in this case unusually well-intentioned, they are part of something rather wicked. At the very least, as our friend Amiel said um, afterwards, the army that night issued a statement, exp you know, describing the incident. And the statement is, from beginning to end, a concoction of lies. The army said, the peace activists, these activists though, they don't call us that, of course, you know. These people came down in order to make a provocation, and the army says they, were, they ignored um, what's called... Um, an order declaring a closed military zone, which wasn't true because they never saw the order, and so on like that. It was a whole pack of lies. So Amiel said, um, at the very least, those soldiers who were there and who knew the truth and took part of it, they were going to be in some situation of what you might call a kind of cognitive dissonance. Maybe not all of them, but some of them probably, because they've been sent there to protect the settlers and the army that sent them was lying about the whole incident. Um, I, I should say, you know, that I've been through rather a lot, too many incidents like that myself. Just a few months ago in February, I was with a group of activists and we were caught in a kind of, um, I don't know, sort of cul-de-sac um, on the hill and these settlers came down and they were stoning us with these big, huge rocks. Actually, I think they were trying to kill us. And believe me, 
they would have no compunction about killing us, no question about that. So the question of what is going on in the minds of the soldiers and the policemen and the officers who sit in the military courts and the bureaucrats and um, the government offices and so on, that question interests me because these soldiers are not bad people. They're just ordinary people. They're in the army. See, I want to say a couple of things about this. We're talking about wickedness, you know. So these soldiers, they're part of a system that has done its best to efface any trace of the individual soldier's subjective personal existence to say nothing of his or her freedom of thought and choice. I can tell you, I was in the army, I was in a war, I know what it's like. That's what the army is all about. It turns human beings into pieces of disposable equipment. And probably the only way to survive it, for most soldiers, is to kind of turn off the mind. You know, that's really something rather important. I'll come back to that in just a second. Not everybody uh, manages to numb the mind. There are always some unusual individuals who manage to extricate themselves from this system of which they're a part. Um, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. When I try to imagine myself backwards, as it were, if I imagine myself as the soldier I was a long time ago, let's say 30 years ago, in that position that these soldiers were in the incident that I'm describing, I, you know, I would really like to believe that I would have had the wit and the courage to try to do something more active, but you know, I'm not sure that I would have. And I don't know if you could know about that uh, until you find yourself in that situation. So there's that system. That's the first thing to keep in mind. They're part of this system. That doesn't explain everything by any means. That system works because human beings faced with danger and conflict, including ethical conflict, seem to seek passivity as their immediate goal. It feels safe. And as I just said, it comes along with this very powerful numbing of the self, as if perception and feeling were anesthetized along with the ability to feel or to imagine or to understand or to know. All of these things go underground. So I wanted to quote somebody who became for a little while rather well known in Israel. He's a singer, I believe. His name is Alon Mizrahi. Um, so here's the kind of thing that can happen. It's really important to hear this example. This man, he's a popular singer, and he was very much on the right. He was very much in favor of the settlement enterprise, and he hated Arabs and even more, all Arabs, and even more than Arabs, he hated people like me, like us. Um, and then something happened to him, a strange thing, he went to a film in the Cinematheque in Tel Aviv, he went to some film about a Palestinian topic, I don't know, some small thing triggered a change. It is often like that, you know, some small thing. And he emerged from this film a kind of different person. And he you know, made, a, made public statements, he's a public figure. So people asked him in interviews, how did this happen to you? you know, why did you leave this kind of mainstream, consensual um, world of Israel today? And why are you now on the other side? And he said the following sentence. He said, you have to extinguish something big in yourself to be over there in that other state, you know? So that numbness, which doesn't require a decision, and yet is nonetheless somehow a kind of choice, in that it reflects something powerful and real in the person, that numbness, I think, feels better, at least for a while, than lucid awareness, which, as the great psychoanalyst Neville Symington has said, actually hurts. Here's the sentence that Symington uh, writes. He says, knowledge can be free of pain, but awareness never. 
And I think this is especially true for moral awareness, which comes along with remorse. Remorse hurts. And also, by the way, there's the danger that if you do not anesthetize yourself, you may have to feel your own rather large domain of freedom. And there is nothing that human beings fear more than knowing that they are free. Okay, so time is short. Um, I'm going to speak about another 20 minutes or so, okay? Vidya, okay? Okay. Have the pictures gone off? Oh, how did that happen? Okay. Um, time's short. I'm going to tell you just two or three small vignettes, anecdotes, just to make clear the kind of thing I want to argue. So, um, actually the first example I wanted to mention to you has to do with a judge in the Israeli civil courts. Um, a friend of ours, a um, very key figure in Tayush, uh, his name is Ezra Nawi. Uh, he was a, he's a plumber, was a plumber, he's an ordinary man. He, believe it or not, without ever having read a single word that Gandhi wrote, um, somehow reinvented Gandhian nonviolent uh, protest out of his own experience, out of his own self. Anyway, there was, uh, in February of 2007, there was a house demolition in a Palestinian place called Um el Khair. It's a place we know very well, we have friends there. Um, a house, I mean, Um el Khair is a shanty town. Um, these are, it's a confabulation of, I don't know, these kind of shacks made of tin and mud and brick and a little wood, whatever is at hand. February, it's really cold in those hills, it's freezing cold. Um, since Palestinians who live in what is called Area C, that's all the area that um, the settlements are in, that's 60% of the West Bank, Palestinians who live in this area can never get a building permit. It's impossible for them, almost impossible. So naturally they build without the permit because they have large families, you know, and then the army or the civil administration, which is the unit in charge of the uh, occupation, um, they then send their bulldozers to destroy these buildings that were built without a permit. It's a very routine thing. So on that day in February of 2007, Ezra Nawi, this friend of ours, uh, he, th first of all, he threw himself down on the ground in front of the bulldozers, kind of classic Gandhian moment, and they picked him up, and then he ran into this shack that was being demolished, about to be demolished. You know? So then two policemen, border policemen, ran after him into the shack. All of this was documented, and we have videos, except the critical 30 seconds when he and the border policemen were inside the shack, you know. So then when they came out, they, of course, they arrested him and handcuffed him and all of that. They claimed that he had raised his hands against them, which is a crime. And Ezra denied it, and I believe Ezra, I've been through all kinds of um, hair-raising moments with him in which he was never violent at all, but uh, came to court some years later and um, the judge came down to the word of these border policemen against Ezra's word, and the judge believed the policeman, as was her prerogative, and she sentenced Ezra to a month in jail, which is not a huge sentence, but the worst part of it was that he had a three-year uh, sentence, uh, a conditional sentence, if he were ever arrested again. And there was no way that Ezra Nawi was not going to be arrested again. It's impossible. So it was a pretty serious thing, you could say. And um, I wanted to read you a few sentences from the judge's, um, you know, um, sentencing from the document. Uh, they may sound familiar to you. The whole thing, actually, in my view, is extremely reminiscent of um, the trial of Mahatma Gandhi in Ahmedabad in 1922, where the judge sent Gandhiji to jail. Um, and Gandhiji made a very remarkable speech. So here's what the judge said. 
in her judgment, she said, freedom of expression is not the freedom to incite and take actions that prevent or disrupt police work. Freedom of expression does not allow for riots, incitement, or violence. Democracy, he was found guilty of incitement, by the way, although you heard just a moment ago what he did, there was no incitement for sure. Democracy cannot allow this, for if the law enforcement system collapses, anarchy will reign, and democracy and freedom of expression will be no more. The fact that a person is acting in the name of one ideology or another, as justified as it may be, may, is no excuse to commit offenses in the name of that ideology, and in this matter there is no difference between left-wing activists, right-wing activists, religious, secular people, or other groups in conflict. That's the judge speaking, you know. Those of you who are interested in this can compare it to the judge's statement in Ahmedabad in 1922. So I want you to understand, I'm not claiming that this judge is a wicked person. She's an ordinary person. She might even be quite a good person, but she did something which in my mind, well, I think it's kind of wicked. She sent an innocent man to prison. You know, I had a fantasy. I, many of us were in court in the days, you know, throughout the trial. And I, I had to give a character witness. I told the judge I thought a day would come when Israeli school children learn about Ezra Nawi and what he did in school. And now I'm not sure which day is going to come first, that day or the day when the state collapses under the weight of its accumulated, accumulating wickedness. Um, I had a fantasy sitting in the court over those many days. I thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice if this judge said, it's a fantasy, my fantasy. I thought, wow, suppose she had said, she had the great, a great opportunity to say, look what the state was doing and look at Ezra's attempt to protest. House demolitions in Umm el Khair, however legal they may be in some technical sense, are in fact brutal demonstrations of power inflicted on innocence. They also happen to be illegal under international law. When Ezra threw himself down in front of the bulldozers, he may indeed have been hampering a public service in the discharge of his duties, but since in this case those duties were reprehensible, and since there was nothing violent in Ezra's act, we would do well to see it in its courageous aspect as a moral statement in the face of oppression. I think the judge had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to say something like that. I didn't expect her to do that, of course, and of course she didn't, you know. But that was what I wanted her to say, you know. See, it's that kind of wickedness that I'm interested in. It's a subtle thing. It's not some kind of brute demonstration of force. It's a subtle thing, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. I wanted to tell you about a time when, um, here I'm gonna tell you about one of the officers of the civil administration, army officer, career officer, also, definitely not a wicked man. Here's the situation. Um, we were with these shepherds, and we were trying to take them back to a well, a Palestinian well, which was off limits to them because the Israeli settlers had stolen it. Um, so we were taking them there so that they, with the sheep, lots of sheep and goats, so that the, you know, the herd could drink at the well, their well. They couldn't go there without us. So then the settlers turned up, as always, and um, then the soldiers arrived, and soldiers didn't at first know what to do, and they eventually this rather senior officer turned up, and he was the one who was supposed to decide what's going to happen at that particular moment. This is a place called Tawamin. So the officer, you know, he, he, very experienced in that area, he said, well, he said, this well belongs to these Palestinians. It's a Palestinian well, that's certain. However, all the access routes to the well, all the area around it, now belong to the Israeli settlement of Susia. So they're not allowed to go to the well. And therefore, you have to leave, he said to us and the, and the, uh, and the shepherds. So then, remember Ezra Nawi, the one who got sent to jail, he was there that day. So he said, said to me, you go please talk to this guy, distract him, keep his mind off of this, and we're going to go ahead and, and water the sheep, you know, while that is happening. So I was prepared to do that. Um, 
So I went to him and I said to him politely, um, could I have a word with you? He said, yeah, no problem. So I said, you know, I mean, what are they supposed to do? Doesn't it seem to you a little crazy what you just said? You said it's a Palestinian well. Are they supposed to put the sheep in helicopters and parachute them down into the well? Doesn't it seem crazy? So I want to read to you what he said to me. And because I don't want to, um, you know, distort his words. Here is what he said in translation, of course. He said, crazy? Of course it's crazy. Everything and everyone here is crazy. The settlers are crazy, and you people are crazy, and we soldiers are crazy, and the officers above me are crazy, and the bureaucrats are crazy, and the politicians are crazy, and even the sheep and goats are crazy down here. So far, so good. But then he said a sentence which was chilling to me. He said, that's why I follow my orders. See, I'm interested in that kind of wickedness. I was going, the time's getting short, I was going to tell you about a policeman who I got to know rather well because I got arrested a few times by this, by this man. He's a very jovial, friendly guy. And we had good reason to believe that actually he was on our side of the political fence. Um, I liked him. Um, you know, it got to the point where uh, on a Saturday morning, if he turned up, he would say to me, oh, so good to see you, Professor Shulman. You haven't been a guest of ours for a while, you know, something like that. And, uh, but this guy, who, again, I want to say he's a good, good man, really a good man, I thought. Um, so in those situations, which were routine situations, he would invariably do what in my eyes was the wrong thing. Let's say we were helping these Palestinian owners of a particular field clear that field of rocks. And the settlers then came down and then they called the army and the army called the police and of course they were threatening us and they pronounced it a closed military zone which is an illegal thing to do. Um, it's a ruling from the Supreme Court, you know. So eventually, um, yeah, well, so he arrested several of us, um, more than once. Um, he said things like, um, I would say to him, you know, you know these settlers here, they're criminals, they're violating international law, and they've taken the land away, stolen it from the legitimate owners, you know, and you're helping them, you're defending them. And he would say to me, you may well be right, but that's irrelevant here. That's an amazing statement too. That's irrelevant, he would say, you know. Or he would say, I would say, look, you know, the, the thieves are here and the legitimate owners and you're aiding and abetting the thieves. And he would say, that's true. Maybe it's true, but I'm here to enforce the law. So, you know, over time, because I got to know this man, I used to feel that I, I could see him struggle with himself just a little bit. I'm not sure that this is right, but I could see that I thought I saw him often, actually, hesitate as if he were in some inner conflict, as if he had a conscience, you know, and was kind of torn inside, and as if there were a moment when he could have chosen otherwise, even though he invariably chose, you know, what in my eyes was the wrong motion. So um, I have a book coming out about these things soon. There's a kind of long meditation about this guy, the policeman, you know. I'll just tell you one last quick story. It fits into the same category. So there is a place, um, it's this long valley like you were seeing in the pictures. Um, fertile valley had been made off bounds um, to the Palestinian owners. Um, for many years, actually, and we took them, we took them back to this valley, and little by little, it's agonizing work. Um, week after week, we would go there, and we pushed the area that was going to be theirs, they were going to be allowed to bring their flocks to, we would push it almost literally millimeter by millimeter, another another little bit, week after week, went on for four years like that. Eventually, the courts ruled that they had access and should have access to the whole of this valley. It was a 
for us, you know, big achievement. I mean, we have these micro victories. Um, that means you have to go there and you're chased off of the field at gunpoint again and again and uh, the whole crazy thing, but it actually worked for quite a while. So then I was in this place, um, and this is, I guess, you know, about a year ago. Um, suddenly, these soldiers turn up and they tell the shepherds that we were with, you know, you, have to, you can't be here, this is off bounds to you. And in other words, that victory that we'd had, had suddenly disappeared and they said, you know, you have to go away. So we were, of course, trying to talk to these soldiers and their commanding officer, he was a very young guy, hardly more than a child in a way, you know. And he was into that sort of macho thing that soldiers have. And um, so we brought, we showed him the Supreme Court ruling which says that it's illegal for the army to declare a closed military zone, especially if it involves removing Palestinian peasants or farmers from their lands, you know. So we show him, we take this with us all the time, you know, we showed it to him. He said to me, he said to me, I don't need to read any papers, I don't need to see any judgments, I don't need any books, I don't need any written document. I have my gun. That's enough for me, he said. What do you think? It's pretty wicked in my opinion. I, I don't think there's any excuse for it. So in the last few minutes, I'll take another maybe five minutes and I'll just say a few things about what I would like to suggest one might learn from all of this, you know. Um, there is um, a question about whether a person in those situations has a choice or makes a choice. Like my policeman, does he make a choice? You know, I think he makes a kind of choice. It's not a decision, it's not as if he deliberates over it, but it's a kind of a choice. I think that there is some small margin of inner freedom that everybody has, and that could have maybe allowed him to activate within himself some gesture of protest. So you might ask me, what evidence do I have that there is such a thing as that tiny internal free space, some gap in the self. But actually there's rather a lot of evidence because we know people who have made that choice, you know. I have a student in Jerusalem, young student. She was born in the most ferocious and barbaric of all the Israeli settlements, a place called Yitzhak. She grew up indoctrinated in this kind of crazy ideology that they have. And for, I don't know how she did it, but somehow she crossed the lines, you know. And she told me, one of the first things she said to me, she said, I'll never again think those kinds of things that I was taught to think. I don't know how it happened. It's a gentle soul. And there was a soldier at a place called Bil'in, which was a site of many protests going on for years, and this soldier couldn't stand it anymore, and he crossed the lines. He used to come down with us to South Hebron. And recently there have been some um, very interesting uh, reports in the social media by by soldiers who are snipers, that in the Gaza area is the front line. As you probably read in the newspaper just a couple of months ago, these Israeli snipers shot over a hundred, well actually killed over a hundred um, unarmed Palestinians who were demonstrating on the other side of the fence, you know. So interestingly in the course of that period, a few snipers who had been snipers for the whole of their army service and had done things like that revealed that they were tortured by their conscience. They felt remorse, you know. I feel pretty sure that some of the snipers from a couple of months ago, some of them might someday feel remorse. And you might be surprised to learn that many young Israelis have refused to serve in the occupied territories. Some, uh, like Yigal Broner, who's sitting here, uh, went to military jail for this. Others, like me, were transferred out of their combat units to other units where this kind of protest was irrelevant. And many, I think hundreds, it's possibly even a few thousand, I don't know, have um, come to some arrangement with their units in which they're not sent to the territories. And these are people who, I think, have learned to say the magic word, the musical shabda of defiance that creates the living human being. That word is no. 
It's the most amazing word in the language, any language. Don't misunderstand. I like the word yes, too. There are occasions when one can say yes, but in those conditions, it's really important to say no. No. I'm standing on this hill, and you're attacking these shepherds and chasing them away. I'm no. I say no. I'm not going to let you do it. You can do to me whatever you want. I'm going to say no. And I'll go on saying no. And we'll be here every week. Again and again. No. And again no. And no. If necessary until the end of time. And we will bear witness. That's the magical word. It's an amazing thing. Some people have it in them to say this, this word. So here's the gist of my argument. You still remember Nigama Sharma? Remember how cruel he was, how wicked, how unfeeling and self-centered and driven and benumbed, and how great pain changed all of that. So don't you think that if you follow the logic of the story, he must have had that tiny margin of an inner space, that very fragile, precarious space, that little gap. It's not an open gap. It's a volatile space, and it's a subtle space. And space is only a metaphor, but there's something inside. There was that possibility that he had that was kind of waiting for him to discover it, and he almost missed the chance. And my policeman friend has it, and the soldiers from last week who maybe could have acted but didn't, they have it, and that officer who follows his orders, he has it. In fact, probably everybody has it. So there is, in my view, in my experience, a link between the everyday wicked act, I'm talking about everyday wickedness, not some savage thing, everyday wicked act. There's a link between that and the subtle space where we have a choice or something like a choice. I, I want to claim that everyday wickedness as we commonly encounter it, or as we enact it in ourselves, is itself a subtle thing a matter of shifting ephemeral subtectonic surfaces. And I think it's a whole person act, not a dichotomous black and white division in the self, but a flesh and blood sort of thing, often rooted not in moral clarity, which is itself a rather rare thing, but in moral ambiguity, the ground of most human action. And that is the space where awareness lives or comes alive and that's the space where remorse might happen. I'm a kind of disciple of a French philosopher whom some of you will know. His name is Vladimir Jankilevich, or Jankilevich. Jankilevich in the Yiddish pronunciation. In French, they call him Jankilevich. I think he's the most important 20th century philosopher after Bergson. He has an amazing book, a wonderful book, about remorse. It sounds odd to say that there could be a wonderful book about remorse. It's a wonderful book. And he talks about remorse as an act of healing. He says a person who feels remorse is already, he's, uh, there's a sign of, of wholeness and wellness in the person who is capable of feeling remorse, but only if it happens in a spontaneous way. It's not something that you sort of re reflect upon. It happens to you, genuine remorse. That's the remorse which he says is capable of healing yourself or itself or the mind. And there are things that go with that. There are the triggers that might somehow trigger remorse. And sometimes you might need even a little touch of despair, which can also be healing, believe it or not. Kierkegaard says the greatest despair is not to have despaired. So we began with Nigama Sharma and his surprising capacity to love. And I'm ending with a no less surprising conclusion, unforeseen by me when I started thinking about these things, about the subtle zone of choice, usually exercised in wicked ways. And lest you think me overly sanguine about what human beings are and what they do, I take refuge in William Butler Yeats' wonderful lines from this great poem of his, The Prayer for My Daughter, I have a new granddaughter, she's six weeks old. I think it might be a good prayer for her too. And what Yeats wrote is, he says, hearts are not had as a gift, but hearts are earned 
by those who are not entirely beautiful. And by beautiful, he meant, I think, good. Those categories merge in Yeats, in fact, in many great poets. So hearts are not had as a gift, but hearts are earned by those who are not entirely good. This is my paraphrase, which I know is true to my own life. Thank you for listening to me.